Hello, this is Slater Blauer and you are watching Violin Lounge TV. And here's my guest, Emily Williams, a violinist and teacher in Mississippi, USA. Welcome, Emily. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Great. We're going to talk about uh, managing a high-level teaching studio. And uh, with high level, I mean uh, that it's uh, flourishing, that you have enough students. Uh, that you get uh, paid well for your work, but also that your students get uh, uh, great progress, uh, that they practice a lot. Uh, and that's what we all want as teachers. And I think for uh, students, it's also very interesting uh, to see what are the elements uh, in a lesson that make you uh, progress. And of course, also the elements outside of the lesson. Um, well, but first, uh, tell, tell us a bit about yourself, about your current activities as a violin teacher and violinist, perhaps. Sure. Yeah, well, I um, have a studio of about 20 students that I teach out of my home. Um, I also teach at a local college and I play with um, the local symphony. So I'm gigging a lot, doing that type of thing. So those are the main activities that take up most of my um, week. And recently, um, I've created an online course for mm. violin and viola teachers, um, and it's called Strategic Strings. So that has been in progress for the last six months or so, um, and I just completed it recently. Um, the goal in making this course is to help violin and viola teachers create financially sustainable studios um, and address areas in their teaching that are holding them back from getting the quality students that they want to teach, um, and also how to attract the quality students that they want to teach, um, and just build confidence in any areas of their teaching that they um, just don't really feel as secure in as they would like to. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting because most uh, teaching courses are uh, about how to teach and how to explain subjects and stuff. Uh, but you are talking about a full concept of also how to run a studio, uh, how to attract students and uh, how to get them to uh, practice and get them to progress. Uh, yeah, because... yeah um, the course has seven modules and I think that while a lot of teaching um, either courses or seminars or workshops or instructional videos online, they focus on the how to's of teaching um, and I do include that in my course. Um, but it's more than that, because if you only have that, then you only have part of what you really need to, to be an effective teacher. Um, so there's seven modules, including um, handouts and audios and videos, as well as live lesson footage of me teaching so that you can really see how like, I use this information and apply it with my own students. Um, and I think a really useful thing as well in the course is that there's four personal chat sessions that each client gets with me so I can really work with them on what's personal to their teaching, what their particular problems are, how to maybe address a certain student or a certain issue. Um, so those are uh, the, the components. And then uh, clients can choose to work towards a certificate of completion if they want to, um, which they can hang in their studios. It's great to put on a resume um, and they complete the seven mastery assignments. There's one for each module and I give them feedback to make sure that they're getting out of the course what I intend for them to mm -hmm. get out of the course. Um, so when they do those mastery assignments, when they complete each of those at the end of the course, then they can work towards a certificate if they choose to do so. Okay, good. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, teachers in general uh, learn how to teach at a conservatory or, uh, you know, depending on where you live and another type of uh, teacher training. Uh, maybe Suzuki, it uh, seems to be very popular in the United States. In uh, Europe, it's a bit smaller. Um, and uh, but, but what I hear of teachers is the main problem is that they have so much skills and they know so, so much repertoire and books, etc. But they don't really get to use them because their students don't really get to that level. And uh, the main reason of that is not because they're not talented enough, uh, but in most cases because they don't practice. Um, and... Uh, uh, well, I read an interesting article on your website about being a hard teacher and uh, a lot of teachers, I think, are afraid of uh, uh, demanding practice of their students. 
uh, because they are afraid that if they do that, that all their students will walk away. I sometimes hear teachers, <laughs> you know, if I send all my students away who don't practice, uh, I c I'm not making a living. Uh, That's you, right. <laughs> you have a, a different vision on that, and that was very uh, enlightening. Can you, can you tell a bit more about it? I do. Um, so I would consider myself a hard teacher in that I expect a lot of my students. Um, and I will dismiss students from my studio if they don't meet the practicing requirements that I have. Um, and or if they are practicing, but they aren't putting in the, the quality practicing that's required to make progress. Um, it's kind of both of those. And um, like you said, I think teachers are afraid that if they implement a policy and they're willing to dismiss students, um, then that they're going to lose students and they won't be able to have a financially stable studio. And that maybe students are going to lose their love of music, sort of like, you know, like, well, we need to teach them because this is good for them and they need to love music. So we'll just deal with the fact they don't practice. Yeah. Um, but what I found is actually that the opposite is true, that when you have standards and you enforce them, um, that you actually keep students, you attract the type of students that you want to teach that will practice, um, which actually creates a more financially stable studio. And I think that when students practice and progress consistently, they actually gain a love of music um, that is not possible for those who don't practice. So I, I think it actually increases a student's ability to love music um, and do it for their, for their whole lives, even if it's just for fun and their own enjoyment. Um, so I think, um, first of all, a, uh, it creates a less stressful and financial um, stable, a stable studio because it weeds out a lot of the students that aren't a good fit. So there's, there's going to be students out there who are just never going to practice, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, so while this may seem like lost income if you aren't taking these students into your studio, I think it removes that revolving door syndrome where you have students come in and they take lessons for a little while and then they leave and then you have more come in and then they leave. And that to me is quite stressful, um, but it's also lost income because you have to keep recruiting new students and then you lose the income from those students and you're keeping having to do this cycle. Yeah. Um, so when you have students that you have kind of, uh, you've given your expectations to and they've agreed to the expectations, they're going to stay in your studio for longer. And yeah. that is a financially secure student. Um, so I think in that respect, it makes your studio my, more financially stable. Yeah. Um, I also think that stricter standards, you gain a reputation in your community when you have stricter standards and, and that all of your students uh, abide by these standards. So when you're looking at how to attract the type of quality students that you want to teach, that reputation that you have, those students are going to hear of that and the types of students that you want to teach are going to come your way really without you having to do a whole lot. Yeah. Um, and eventually those types of students are going to need longer lesson lengths. So you may start them out with a half an hour lesson, but as they progress, they get uh, into higher level music, um, longer lesson lengths are required. So you're really filling your studio without having to gain many more students because then these students will eventually be taking up twice as much time mm -hmm. as students who are only taking up your half an hour spot, revolving in that, that revolving door and then leaving and coming back and yeah. that type of thing. Yeah, um, and it costs you a lot of time uh, and energy in uh, yeah, making new appointments and stuff and uh, right. all the fuss around uh, organizing a new student and uh, attracting a new uh, student. Uh, what was also interesting to read that that actually intermediate or advanced students don't really stop suddenly. Uh, beginner students, you know, the first couple of years are quite hard and you don't get results and you can't play beautifully and stuff. And I think a lot of students are stopping in that stage. But I think if you are practicing consistently and uh, taking lessons uh, consistently for five or ten years, then the chance that you're, that you're going to stop is quite small. Yes, and I have found that there have been students who have come to me who have not been required to practice and their parents are kind of bringing them to me as a last ditch effort to be like, I want my student to continue. My child needs to love music. And um, so what I see is that for a while, you know, doing just what's fun and allowing the student to do whatever they want to do works for a short time, maybe even a few years. But eventually yeah. those students are going to hit that brick wall. Um, so. What I find that is if you have practicing requirements and you progress your students evenly and you're not allowing them to move forward before they're ready, then they won't hit that brick wall. It won't be um, 
as likely that they will because they're going to be able to progress and they'll get more joy out of what they're doing um, and they're going to want to continue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and what's also you you mentioned reputation earlier. Uh, sometimes if I have a student, for example, who takes sometimes adults take students uh, take uh, lessons for uh, once in a month or once in six weeks. And, uh, you know, I'm always afraid that the student's going to play somewhere and uh, going to say, I have uh, five years of lessons with Slata. And I think, oh, no, <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> she must oh, be an awful teacher. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that can happen, too. Um, I do require my students to come on a weekly basis. So if I have a student who, you know, comes to me and says, hey, I'd like to take lessons, but I really can only come once a month mm-hmm. or twice a month, then I'm going to yeah. say, you know, I'd love to teach you. But it really needs to be a weekly commitment. Okay. Um, so I do have some longer term students who have that I do teach maybe once a month or twice a month because of external circumstances. But they've been students that I've worked for, with for several years. Mm. And I know them and I know that they're going to come back prepared for their next lesson. Yeah. Um, they know what I expect and they've, you know, they have that solid foundation. So I do yeah. make some exceptions, but definitely not for new students. Okay, yeah, they have to be able to uh, study or practice uh, uh, independently, I guess. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which um, is something the course kind of teaches you how to get your students to that point that they're able to do that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and um, what I was uh, wondering is how you treat uh, parents who uh, who might think that uh, students learn everything in the lesson or. Uh, uh, are saying, well, I don't want to force my child to practice because uh, they need to have fun, etc., etc. Uh, because I think uh, if you don't have the parents behind you, uh, it's really hard to uh, uh, to have influence as a teacher. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, you definitely need to have the parents behind you, especially for the real young ones. Um, so the, the first thing that I do is I explain my studio policies up front. So if that sounds like something that they aren't really interested in doing, Mm -hmm. they're gonna be like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks, I'm not interested in pursuing that. Um, For those who may decide, yeah, I wanna do that, and then they get into the weekly practicing, and they're like, oh, this is more than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. Um, I work with them, and I explain why weekly practicing is so important, and I do explain to them that the improvement and progress happens during the week, not with me at lesson. And that um, what happens with me at lesson is that uh, as the the expert, I can take that student and say, okay, this is what you need to do in order to move forward. But the moving forward happens then when they apply that every day during the week. And I think when you educate parents and you explain it like that, yeah. um, they get it. It makes sense. And yeah. then you can get them on board with that idea and they, they understand and they'll support you in that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also a very important point uh, to see yourself uh, really as the expert who uh, that there isn't really a discussion you know how a student progresses and you know the parents don't <laughs> right and, and if you present yourself that way in a you know a friendly but a firm way mm-hmm. they respect that from you and they will they will take you as as the one who knows more than they do about that concept yeah yeah exactly um, so what do you do if a student doesn't practice? Uh, I, I think you have up front a very uh, good gateway uh, for uh, setting expectations, but also perhaps um, uh, telling some people just if you just want to practice once a week, then uh, I'm not your teacher, perhaps. Right. <laughs> um, but what do you do when, the, when they don't practice? That's a great question. Um, so first I remind them of what they agreed to up front. They, they know that that's what my expectation is. And I explain why it's so important. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it's a a matter of that, they want to meet the expectations, but schedules are not working or they're, you know, the, the child is fighting with their parent and practicing or something like that. Mm -hmm. I do my best to work with my parents and with my students to find something that will work for them. Um, it's, it's, it's easier to keep students you already have and work with them rather than just being like, well, you aren't meeting the expectations, so I'm dismissing you from my studio. So I will dismiss students, but only after I have done everything within my power to really help them meet the expectations and yeah. get where I want to be. Um, so it's, it, it's up to them to make that happen, but I will work with them. So I don't really spend
spend a whole lot of, I think a lot of teachers spend energy trying to find practice incentives and conjole these students mm -hmm. to practice and um, that type of thing. And I feel like I, I help them, but I don't spend a lot of energy like trying to get them to practice. Um, the, if they want to study with me, then they'll kind of meet those expectations. Um, and they see the benefit when they do practice, yeah. they see the results that happen. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is one of the, the biggest ways to, to get parents on board. Um, if I do have like a, a problem with a student not practicing and I've done all of the things that I've kind of talked about, um, I will put my students on a probationary period and, I'm, um, and I will say, you know, we've talked about this, this is what I expect, I do need you to meet these expectations if you want to study with me. So I'm going to give you a, a month mm -hmm. and you need to figure out how to make this practicing happen on a daily basis in this month. I will do whatever you need me to do. I will help you yeah. um, to make that happen. Yeah. Um, but this is the time limit I'm giving you. Um, and at the end of that time limit, if things have changed, great. We keep, we continue to move on. Everything's great. Um, if not, then that is when I would dismiss a student. Um, and I have had students I've had who I've had to dismiss or usually they choose to leave. They realize they respect okay. my time and they respect what I do. And they say, we're not meeting your expectations. We don't want to waste your time. Um, yeah. but I've had those students come back later. Okay. Um, maybe when the child is a little older or yeah. schedules have changed yeah. and they say, we want to study with you again. We're ready to meet those expectations. We've okay. cleared our schedules. Um, my child is older. They've decided they want to do this now. Um, so th those types of things do happen. So you aren't necessarily losing the student forever uh, yeah. when you do do that. Yeah. And when they come back, I think they are really committed, uh, yes. because they're not going out again and coming in again and stuff. So I think they Correct. really know what they are beginning, uh, uh, what they're starting. Um, I, th I think, uh, this would speak to a lot of teachers, but, uh, the question, uh, that, that they might have is if you currently have a teaching studio with maybe weekly students and maybe students who come once in a while and stuff, um, some students who practice, some who don't, how do you change that? Uh, because uh, it's strange perhaps yeah. for students, if you have kind of, uh, uh, tolerated it for, uh, for years and, uh, and then you're going to uh, become a hard teacher. <laughs> right, right. So I think it really depends on the teacher's situation. So most teachers are not in a position to just cold turkey kind of say, okay, everybody, I have new policies. This yeah. is what they are. If you want to agree with them, great. If not, then go somewhere else. Yeah. Because then you're putting yourself at a very uh, financially instable situation uh -huh. where you may have a lot of students leave. Yeah. Um, so I, I would not advocate that unless you are in that position mm -hmm. and the money is, is not going to be a, a, that big of a, of a problem for you that you can take that hit. Yeah. Um, but most teachers are not in that position. So what I would recommend is that teachers implement new policies slowly um, and that they choose ones that are to implement first that are either going to make the biggest difference with their students and getting the results that they want or the ones that are the easiest to implement. So you kind of slowly introduce these things and over time, then parents can adopt and yeah. uh, address the, the new policies and, and you aren't hitting them all at once with yeah. things. So this may take the uh, six months to a year mm -hmm. um, to kind of make that transition. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, any new students you have coming in, you have your new policy set, you know where you're going. And yeah. so those are the policies that you introduce to those new students and you say, here's what I expect. Are you willing to do this? Um, you get them on board. So you're only working with your old students. Every new student who comes in is meeting those expectations that you want from them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's a good uh, tip. Um, then let's talk about your uh, online course that uh, we mentioned in the beginning of the uh, conversation. Uh, in this uh, uh, chat, we uh, mostly talked about the student policies and the practicing. Um, mm -hmm. But as we said, the, the course is a kind of a full uh, package. Yes. Um, can you tell a little more about your method and mm -hmm. what you teach in the course? Sure. Um, so I don't really, I consider my um, 
my course an approach rather than a method. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just like opposed to the idea of method, but I do consider it more of an approach rather than calling it a method. Um, and the reason is because I think when I think of the term method, I think of like buying into this whole system um, where you have to teach these certain concepts in this certain order with these certain books. And here's the set in stone progression that students have to move through. Yeah. Um, so in contrast, my course is more of an a, approach in that it can be used with all levels of students wherever they're currently at. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be used with different repertoires. So the repertoire that you might currently use mm -hmm. uh, that may work with the course. There's certain books that don't work as well as others, um, but it's not that you have to, you know, buy into this whole system. Um, yeah. Different repertoire works. Um, there is, a, the book that um, I wrote with my husband, The Beginning Violinist, mm -hmm. um, I do recommend that you start with that book. But after that, I use all different um, books with my students. Um, and it can be applied in different settings. So private lessons, group lessons, I've used um, these ideas in school settings. Um, so it's it's versatile in that way. Um, I think the other way is, is that it can be used with very beginners, um, as well as to assess students who already play. Mm -hmm. um, and I address it with um, sight reading and ear training, uh, music dictation. All of these are included in the course and I show how the, the principles that I teach can be applied in all of these different ways. Um, and it can be used with students who haven't been taught from the beginning using my approach. So you can take any student and right away you can start implementing this. You don't have to um, like completely relearn everything for in a different method. So that's why yeah. I don't consider it a method. It's, it's more of an approach to, um, teaching. Yeah. Yeah. You can take what it, uh, you can take from it, what you, uh, find applicable in the situation of your student and in the method you're, uh, using. Um, and what are the things that separate, uh, your, um, approach, uh, to other teacher trainings or other, uh, seminars? Um, well, I think a big one is that it comes at teaching from three different angles, which I kind of, we kind of um, talked about just a little bit earlier, where the first module addresses the business side of things, um, looking at studio policies. Um, lots of, of teachers are insecure with how to run the business side of things. So you can, you can have the greatest method, you can be the greatest teacher, but if you don't understand the business side of things and that isn't set, um, you're just not going to have the studio that you'd like to have. Yeah. Um, and so dealing with parents, um, the things that stress teachers out, all those things are addressed in module one and studio policies and the business side of running a studio. Mm -hmm. um, the second angle is what most teacher programs include, which is the how to's of teaching. Um, and so that that's included. I have a strategy of teaching. Um, I think it's different than what, uh, a lot of other methods teach. Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned, the Suzuki approach is very popular in the US and um, it focuses a lot on waiting to teach music reading. Whereas yeah. the strategic strings course that I have, I start my students reading right away and I've found great benefits to that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's differences in how I teach my students to set up their left hand. I teach all four fingers from the start, for instance. Okay. Um, and I think that that gains students a better hand set up uh -huh. and teach them their notes better. I've, I've seen just, there's so many benefits to that. So those are some um, differences in the, the aspect of teaching. Um, and then the third angle that this course addresses is that is not usually included in teacher workshops or other types of teaching courses and methods is uh, what I call the transference of information to teachers or uh -huh. to students. So you can have the best information, but if that isn't getting across to your students, yeah. you know, it's not going to be helpful to them. Um, so when students, you know, they can come back week after week and maybe you're trying to, you're doing the same things week after week. And you don't know why what you're teaching isn't getting across. So I address that problem. Um, I teach how to infect, uh, effectively engage students in the learning process so that they will progress faster. Um, and I give step-by-step -step instructions. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more concrete. Um, so you have something to kind of hold on to so that the, the root of your, your teaching is really getting the desired results that you, that you want out of your students. Um, and if it isn't, uh, I give 
helpful helpful ways of dealing with that so that you can you can address that problem. So I think the combination of those three areas into all one course yeah. um, sets this apart from many other teaching training seminars and methods. Okay, great. Um, and uh, if uh, Final Lounge TV viewers are interesting interested in your course, uh, where can they go? Um, well, I can give you a link. Mm -hmm. um, and you can include that on your on your site yep. and it's um, how to teach violin.com so all of the information um, is there mm -hmm. uh, and I can also um, give you a link so you'll see that the price listed for this course on my website um, is 1179 for the whole course um, but I'd like to offer it to your viewers at a discounted price of um, 997. So I can give you a link that will directly take them and they can purchase it at that discounted price rather than going um, through the website. Um, Great. And, and I talked about the um, certificate of completion. Yeah. Um, that's normally a $149 value because of the extra time that I put in mm -hmm. um, to working with clients and that. But um, for your viewers, I'd like to knock $100 off of that. They can get it for $49. Um, so they will get the four personal chat sessions with me the whole online course and the certificate of completion, as well as they get a free um, beginning violinist or violist book, whichever um, they think would be most useful for them in their teaching, mm -hmm. um, all for less than that normal price. So the, if they wanted both of um, those things and receive all those things, it's uh, 1046. So I can give you um, that special price for your viewers. Um, Great. But I'm also happy to speak to any of your viewers who are interested in the course, but have okay. more questions. Um, yeah, I'd, ha I'd be happy to do that as well. And they can go to the website and, um, on my website, all of the modules are listed. You can click through and listen. The introductory audio to each of the modules is available for free. So they can really get an idea of what is in each module, what they're going to be working on. Um, as well as a list of all of the audios, all of the handouts, all of the lesson footage, all of the stuff that's going to be covered is all listed out for them so they can see exactly what they're going to be getting in the course and um it's not going to be a surprise or anything so they can know that the value that they're getting is all right there great well thanks for this uh, uh offer for this discount for our viewers i think they will be uh, very thankful for this um i will put all the relevant links below this video if you're uh, wherever you're watching this um so i think we'll we're uh, at the end of this uh, conversation. It was very interesting, uh, I think, uh, for teachers, but perhaps also for students. Um, and are there perhaps some things you want to share? Or um, I think we covered, you know, pretty much everything that <laughs> that is um, really important. Um, trying to think if there was anything that we missed. Um, I don't, I don't really think that there's, um, I think uh, maybe one thing that I would like to mention um, in terms of uh, the, in, the, in the course, um, one of the main, the broad more applications of the course is uh, the five fundamentals of teaching is what I call them. Mm -hmm. um, when, we, when we consider progress, when we look at student progress, we often say, well, are they, how, how fast are they getting through songs or how many songs are they completing or how many books have they completed in such and such a time? Mm -hmm. um, so my course looks at progress in a different way and it looks at the quality of progress rather than um, how many songs or books or something yeah. that a student gets through. Um, and quality is such a uh, less quantifiable thing. Yeah. <laughs> so what my course does, it breaks it down into five fundamentals um, which are note reading, rhythm reading, right hand technique, left hand technique, and then uh, bow control and tone. And I think that these form the basis um, out of which all other things that we do with our instrument, they feed off of these five things. Yeah. Um, so I go into depth about how to teach these five things, how to assess students for these five things. Um, and I think that that it clears up a lot of the uncertainty and the, well, what do I do with these students? You know, especially yeah. if they already play and come to you. Um, so uh, I guess what I would want, want to leave viewers with, with in, in that respect is that it's very systematic in that way. And you get concrete answers to how to teach these things and how it applies to the rest of everything that you do. So 
Um, uh, I think that that's a really important and unique part of the strategic strengths course. Okay. Do you, uh, do you mean that uh, also in the beginning of the year and the ending end of the year, you assess students, like you give them um, a report or something about the progress um, of the year? Uh, I don't like particularly hand them a report. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I do uh, mentally look at where they are, especially that I have two recitals a year. So those are really good times for me yeah. to assess and say, where was my student last recital? Where are they this recital? What have we accomplished? Yeah. Um, and I give, um, uh, I give clients uh, a way of assessing that for themselves with their students. That's actually one of the um, mastery assignments that they're okay. uh, expected to do. Um, and they fill out what I call a five fundamentals graph. And this helps them have a concrete way of knowing where their students fall in each of these categories, which categories are most important then to address, whether or not their student is ready to move on to the next level of music. Okay. Um, all of those things are kind of uh, assessed in that way. Yeah, and perhaps also if you're taking over a student from another teacher, uh, it's a good way to kind of make a picture of where they are and uh, wh where they need to go. Yeah, that's basically what I do at the first lesson. Um, I think the first lesson with a student that who already plays but you've never you know seen before yeah. can be one of the most scariest, um, uncomfortable. Uh, and so I make that easier. And I use these five fundamentals and the five fundamentals graph to look at a new student and break it down for my own self as yeah. well as with the student and with the parent. So that's um, a, a really a, a, the, the way that I apply it most frequently um, in, in a really organized manner. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for all the tips. Um, uh -huh. And uh, yeah, uh, we had an interview earlier, some years ago, I think, about uh, your book, The Beginning Violinist. So uh, if uh, uh, viewers want to see more of you, uh, they can perhaps take a look at that uh, interview. Well, thanks again for uh, for this interview. And I wish you all the best with, with the course. I hope it will reach a lot of teachers and uh, indirectly students. Uh, so uh, thank you and uh, perhaps until the next time. Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.